Uh, more, it's more specific. Okay. Okay. I think so too. I think it's a lot better. Okay. Okay. Um, and Rebecca, I have your email about a specific section you couldn't find. I have that. I just haven't had a minute to go and find the exact page that it's on. Okay, let me, sorry for the interruptions. I'm just continuing to let people in. Did Brianna Woods make it in? Is she here yet? Oh yeah, I was gonna say for tomorrow maybe we could. Um, Pardon me. Get some. Um, okay. Um, okay. Um, last night I sent out a copy of the extra review sessions. Did everybody get that? That is scheduled yeah. for the review session. Excuse me? Are you talking about a schedule for the review session? Yes. 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 There's four of them. There's two Friday, one Saturday, and one Sunday. So those are addition to lecture, and that would be um, specifically exam to review. Okay. And there's different instructors doing, excuse me, hang on one second. Uh, there's different instructors doing different classes so that the content should all be the same, but the style will be different. Okay, so I am hoping that you can all try and attend um, at least one of them. Um, how do you guys, we, we haven't had great success in the past about students attending extra sessions. Um, what are your first thoughts? Are you, are, are you guys planning on attending one or what are your, what are you thinking? Some of us work. So it's uh, yeah, we have all of on Friday. So. We have clinicals and then we have it's a lot. It's a lot. Our schedule is like booked. So it's kind of hard to say that we'll be able to come. No, I, I do just, look at them all, but it's hard to say I can come during live because mm -hmm. of the school and my work schedule. But I do watch them all. Okay. And I'll be sending out the recordings of all of them as well. Um, so as each professor does theirs, they send out the recordings to the rest of us, and then we post it in our announcements. Okay, so you should, you'll have four recordings as well. So you'll have four live sessions, four recordings. Okay. Um, question, what, oh, sorry. What questions does everybody have before we start this week? Anybody had a chance to review week six, nine, or 32 information for this week coming up? Just want to make, see what, what, if it's going to be new information or brand new information, or if you've reviewed some of it and have an idea of what we're covering. So has anybody had a minute to review it? Okay. Could everybody turn their cameras on, please? Uh, the, except if you're not driving. If you're not, if you're driving, keep them off, please. Um, what else was I going to ask you guys? Um, oh, uh, there's a few groups I still haven't heard from with regards to infectious disease. So if if you're one of those groups, if you would just get that to me in the next day or so of what infectious disease you've chosen, I have have already received several several emails, uh, but there are a couple of groups I haven't heard from yet. So check with your group. Um, did you guys have any questions on the vulnerable population assignment that we reviewed last week for week nine? Did anybody have any questions? Okay. And then my last question is, um, I tried to post uh, in the announcement several tutorials for you guys. Uh, test taking tutorials, critical thinking, math. Um, what, has anybody had a chance to look at any of those? Do you think they'll be helpful? Are they helpful? What's your feedback? I did look at it. It is helpful. Is it? Yeah, okay, there, is there there's any some good strategies there. 
Okay, thanks, Chisa and Danielle. Were there any particular ones that you guys reviewed that you liked? I looked at the critical thinking one and that okay. one I did like okay. that. Okay, okay. I really would encourage all of you to try and at least take a look at the test taking skills tutorials. Um, these are from Elsevier. These are really well done. And there is a reason I sent them to you guys to try and help you out. Um, and to, this should help out for all your classes, um, not just this particular class. So um, uh, what, oh gosh, there was one other question I was gonna ask you guys. Um, sent you the tutorial, sent you the study guide, sent you the review sessions. I know there's one more thing I wanted to ask you guys, and I can't think of it right now. So when it pops back into my brain, I'll interrupt and ask you. Okay. Um, so let's start with chapter six. What What do you guys, excuse me, what do you guys think about when you think about environmental health? What comes to mind? What's environmental health? Air pollution. Yep. Mm-hmm. What else? Anything else come to mind when you think of environmental health? What it, why is environmental health important part of community health? The pollution and the toxins mm -hmm. that we're exposed every day. Yeah, think about how many things we're exposed to on a daily basis. Environmental risks, environmental hazards. Okay, so as community nurses, we're, we are constantly monitoring environmental risks, not only within the community, but certainly within the patients, we uh, families we take care of as well, right? Think of all the environmental risks in homes, right? In schools, in churches, in... Um, you know, out in the community, the, the water, uh, potential contaminated water, air pollution, right? Uh, foodborne issues, okay? These are all environmental risks, right? So some of the objectives, um, if you haven't had a chance to look, that you, the expected knowledge will be how to explain environmental influences that affect our health and disease, right? Which disciplines mostly work closely with nurses' environmental health? What is, who, who monitors environmental health? Um, who develops legislative and regulatory policies that influence environmental health? Okay. So um, we obviously, we know that a healthy environment is essential for op optimal health and healthcare, right? We often take the environment for granted and may fail to, see, fail to see the hazards that are in front of us all day, every day. We are potentially exposed chemically, biologically, radiologically, right? Um, that potentially affect our health and the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, and the products we use, right? We take a lot of that for granted. We just, you know, in our communities, we assume that the water's healthy. We assume that the pollution is, is at a manageable level, okay? But do we really know it is? Okay. Um, some environmental health sciences that um, some definitions are toxicology, epidemiology, and multidisciplinary approaches. What is toxicology? What is that looking at? Toxic. The, like maybe the food poisoning or drugs in their blood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Toxicology. Yep. Toxic. yep. When you think of toxicology screens, drug screens. Okay. Those are environmental, potentially environmental hazards. What's epidemiology? We're going to get that to that in chapter nine, but epidemiology is the study of diseases. Okay. I am going to go to the book for this chapter and just, just a little bit here. Um, we, climate change, environmental risk factor, right? How do we do an environmental health assessment? Well, we need to do the four major areas that we're looking at for environmental health assessment are air, both indoor and outdoor, 
water, land, and food. Chemical, biological, or radiological. And we'll go through the, how to do an environmental health assessment in the book. It's with the I prepare mnemonic, right? We still we do also do windshield surveys. We do environmental databases, environmental health assessment forms, okay? And then when we talk about policy and legislation, and remember this, the PowerPoint is an outline. It's an outline of the chapter. Okay, so we, there are right to know laws, right? We as consumers have a right to know what environmental risks are present, right? We all know in your workplaces, you all know about MSDS sheets, right? The material safety data sheets, what are those? You all know about these in your workplace. That's why they keep all the, the information for every chemical that is using up workplace. That's correct. That's correct. Yes. And you should, you should be aware of where to find that. And if you don't know in your workplace, you should make sure you find out where that's located. Right. How do you do a risk assessment of the environment? How do you do an assessment of environmental risks in children and pregnant women? There's lots of them. Okay. How do we reduce environmental health risks? All right, by applying the basic principles of disease prevention, we certainly have to communicate the risks, ethics, and then governmental environmental protection. Who, 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 uh, what, what laws and, and acts and guidelines pr protect us? And I think you think of, um, what do you think of? What's the big environmental protection program federally that monitors all this. What is that? OSHA. Well, that's for workplace. What EPA, right? The Environmental Protection Agency, right? And nurse as advocacy, nurses have responsibilities to be informed consumers and to be advocates for citizens in their community regarding environmental health issues. I'm skipping through this because I want to get to the book and pull out our essential knowledge from the book. Okay, what are some what are some roles for nurses with regards to environmental health? Think ADPI. We do our assessments, we do our referrals, where community involvement, public participation, communication to the uh, community, epidemiological investigations we are part of, and we should be part of policy development as well. Okay, um, environmental health starts on page 84 um, in the book. Okay, and there's a few things we need to, we want to pull out from here. Oh. Okay, again, here's the, here's your outline of the chapter that we just went through in the PowerPoint. Here's the objectives that we just looked at in the PowerPoint, or that's your slide two. But here's a few things we want to pull out with regards to environmental health in this chapter. Has anybody done um, any of the, the case studies that are in these chapters and the practice application um, exercises, activities that are in these chapters? Has anybody done those that I send you to the answers to each week? No? Okay. I, yeah, I read what you sent us, the case studies you sent. Okay. But I didn't look in the book. No. Okay. Okay. Um, here, okay, Healthy People 2020, we need to know for this chapter. Okay, this is on page 86. Okay, so we need to know what the objectives are related to environmental health are with regards to Healthy People 2020. Okay, a few things they would like to do or looking at objectives are eliminate elevated blood levels in children, minimize the risks of human health and environment posed by hazardous sites. 
reduce the amount of toxic pollutants. So put these, please put these on a, a separate card because we do need to know these. These are the objectives that Healthy People 2020 has regards to environmental health. Okay, here's your definitions of uh, toxicology and epidemiology. These are environment, these are considered environmental health sciences. Right, so toxicology is a science that studies the effects associated with chemical exposures. Epidemiology, we're gonna to get to this in chapter nine, right? Whereas toxicology is a science that studies the poisonous effects of chemicals, epidemiology is a science that helps us understand the strength of the association between exposures and health effects. So disease development. And then there's some additional multidisciplinary approaches that you can read about, but we don't need to worry about these for now. Uh, climate change. You can read about climate change. We know that this is a significant and emerging threat to public health, right? Hang on, I need to X out these. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, all right. Okay, how do we do? How do we do a... Um, let me rephrase that. We should be able to um, apply the ADPI concept, the nursing process concept, to all these different community topics. So now we're talking about environmental health. So this is the how-to on applying the nursing process to environmental health. So here's your ADPI. And here's how um, we apply it to environmental health. Okay, so if we suspect that a client's health problem is influenced by environmental factors, how do we use the nursing process, noting the environmental aspects of the problem in every step? Well, for example, an assessment. Okay, so we are taking our ADPI and moving it out of the acute care setting into the environment, into the community. Right, so your assessment may include questions, inventories that cover environmental issues as part of the general assessment. And there's a box for those below that I'll show you some samples of. Diagnosis, right? How do we relate the disease and the environmental factors in the diagnosis? What's, what, what are the goals? What, what's the plan? What are we gonna do to intervene, evaluation? So that's an important box to, you know, if you're having trouble tra um, transitioning your thinking process from acute care into the community with regards to ADPI, this is an excellent box to review. Page 91. Okay, here's uh, box 6.2. This is called the I prepare mnemonic, right? And this is trying to establish an exposure history. How do we establish an exposure history for an environmental exposure? Okay, and you can go through these. What Investigate potential exposures. Where do they presently work? Where do they presently live? What are the environmental concerns in that particular community? What work have they done in the past? What activities are they involved in? This is how you develop your database for an environmental risk assessment with an exposure. Okay, so that's the I prepare mnemonic. Okay. And then windshield surveys, we've talked about windshield surveys, they're helpful very helpful as a first step in understanding provincial environmental health risks in the community. Right, is it a, is it a rural community, is it an urban community, is it an older community, is it a new development? Is, there, is it near a highway? Is it near railroad tracks? Is it in an industrial um, area of the city? Is it a farming community? I mean, every different place comes with, every different area comes with different environmental risks. And like we said in the outline, the biggest things we look at is air, okay? 
What is a point source? We need to know the difference between uh, with air measuring, air pollution is a significant contributor to health problems. Okay, air pollution is divided into two major categories. We need to know this. What is a point source and a non-point source? Okay, we're on page 92, a point source, often called fixed sites, which are individual identifiable sites, for example, say a smokestack. Okay, those are point sources, they're in place. Non-point sources are the vehicles, the cars, the trucks, the buses. Okay. Question, yeah. um, what, what is smokestack? Anybody want to, anybody want to tell our, our, uh, Joshua what a smokestack is? Is that like a hookah shop? No. I'm guessing. <laughs> it's what generates our electricity. I can't, I can't hear you. What is a smokestack and a hookah? How we get our electricity? Yeah, if you're driving through a community and you see a smokestack, what is that going to look call, like? Call. I don't know who's talking, but I can't. It, you're. It's Rachel. She just has she has a um, bad internet sometimes. Okay, so what is a smokestack, guys? When you're going through a community, it's a factory, and the smokestack is a big pipe the, where the pollution, the smoke comes out of. So the all the pollution and the smoke is going into the air. Okay, Jason or Joshua, excuse me. Yes. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. And Mary, what communities are we likely to see smokestacks in? Well, you see them all over the in the outskirts of the cities. Oh. In the industrial in sections. Industrials, paper mills, yep. chemical plants. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then this next box, um, this is the EPA. Okay, the EP, what are our environmental health resources? The EPA is our biggest, um, the EPA is like the CDC with regards to, um, CDC is, you guys know what I mean, right? I'm having a hard time it's thinking. It's like the CDC for the environment. It's like the CDC for the environment, thank you. So the, and there's many, many agencies that fall under the EPA that monitor all the environmental goings on, the risks, the assessment, the, the um, you know, applications for permits, everything. Okay, here are some of the other um, environmental, envirofacts, um, which I've always find interesting to let students know. This envir, Envirofax website, you can search your location where you live and you can actually put your zip code in and find out what the environmental concerns are in your community related to air, water, toxic emissions and compliance. Okay. That'd be helpful for our paper. <laughs> Pardon me? That'd be yeah. helpful for our paper that's due, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, bookmark this uh, box 6.3 to see if uh, you can use any of these resources for your upcoming assignments. Yep. Um, so they go through each um, of the four, right? We just talked about air. They go through water, water quality. Um, I always think um, with water contamination, I think of that movie, Aaron Brockovich. Guys, remember that movie? Um, that is a classic case of environmental, an environmental disaster, actually, um, of water contamination affecting the community and the catastrophic effects it had. Anybody agree with that? Yeah, and my dad worked for that company and he even agreed with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh so, yeah, it was, it was bad. Yeah, yeah. 
And then you have your, envir your environmental risks from land, right? Past and present use of land can affect the community's health. Local governments determine land use through zoning laws. Um, for example, zoning may prevent a housing development from being built on top of a previously used landfill. So we have to think of our environmental risks with land. It might look good, but you know, agriculturally, it may be a disaster to build on top of it. And so we have land, we have environmental land risk issues as well. Okay, and then food. Food and food production are a source of concern, right? Recent years, foodborne illnesses have been associated with salmonella and E. coli. Okay, who monitors good food practices to make sure the, the water, the, that the water's appropriate they're using, that the staff is washing their hands, cooking time, cooking prep. How do we prevent foodborne illnesses? Right, how do we make sure there's, there's uh, no presence of pesticide residue in our food? How do, I mean, there's so many, so many potential environmental risks with food. And a lot of times we just take it for granted. We walk into a restaurant, we have our breakfast or lunch or coffee shop or dinner or whatever. And we just take advantage, we just take, make assumptions that everybody's following all the environmental guidelines to a T and everything's fine. You know, years ago, one of my kids was five or six years old and got salmonella from eating uncooked chicken nuggets in a restaurant. It was terrible. So, and then the right to know. Um, several environmental statutes, statutes give the public the right to know about hazardous chemicals in the environment, okay? Um, and one of, that's the example, one example is that EnviroFacts section is the website that provides data sources of, ex, of exposures by typing in a zip code. Okay, and then risk assessment. How do we do a risk assessment? Right, a risk assessment, what is that? It refers to the process to determine the probability of a health threat, right? What's your risk assessment from an exposure? What are the four phases of risk assessment? Okay, so I want you to read through those. They start right here on page 94. The first, the second, the third and the final. So I want you to read through those. Okay, they're on page 95. Okay. Um, here's an interesting box, uh, 6.1, environmental agents and potential adverse reproductive outcomes. You know, environmental um, risks can be very significant with pregnant moms. Okay, here's a couple. We don't need to memorize this box, but I just wanted to point out to you, um, you know, we think of lead poisoning. Where's lead poisoning? Maybe old schools, old, old homes. Okay, uh, I wanna point this out. The children are especially at risk. Page 96, children are especially at risk for environmental hazards because of factors such as poverty, lack of, lack of access to healthcare and potentially dangerous environmental situations they live in, right? And they're also at risk because of the size and the immaturity of their immune systems, especially their respiratory systems. Okay, and we know that there, some of the health conditions in children can be associated with environmental risk factors, including autism, cancer, maybe respiratory diseases, asthma, obesity, neurodevelopment. Okay, 
Okay, how do we reduce environmental risks? Preventing problems with less costly, whether the cost is measured in resources consumed or health effects. Education is a primary prevention strategy, right? So we want to focus on primary prevention strategies in the community. We wanna be educating the community on the potential environmental risks that they face, right? Helping them plan intervention strategies, right? Helping them apply the basic principles of disease prevention. For example, here's an example for, home, for a home with lead-based paint. How do we apply a primary prevention strategy of removing, would uh, the, uh, if, a, if we are teaching a family about the uh, risks of lead poisoning, we wanna make sure we educate them on finding out if their house contain, if they have an older house, does it contain anything with lead, any paint with lead? And along that same example, let's say a child is exposed to the lead and starts showing symptoms, right? The child is brought to the healthcare provider. Okay, now we know the child has a lead exposure. So now we have to implement tertiary, a tertiary intervention, which is to reduce the blood level of the lead. Okay, you follow along with that? Okay, on page, I don't know who has to mute themselves, but that'd be great. Um, on page 98 is the levels of prevention related to, uh, in this particular case, it's related to the environment and lead exposure. So a pro primary prevention, um, you know, going back to real quick, going back to exam one, uh, most of you did awesome with the levels of prevention. There were very little level of prevention questions I had to review with students that met, met with me for tutoring. So you guys are getting a really good, um, really good handle on the differences in the three levels of prevention. It's really important for HESI and for NCLEX. It's very, this is really, really essential knowledge that you're able to apply these three prevention levels to different topics. So here it's with lead exposure because we're in the chapter of environmental health, or excuse me, environmental risks. So primary prevention would be to educate parents to use non-lead based paint. And then secondary, which is early identification, early intervention, right? Screening, if lead is found in the paint, remove the paint and replace with non-lead paint. So we're screening. You're doing some kind of a screening to see if your house is. And most inspections now include all of that. And tertiary, at the first sign and symptom of lead exposure, take steps to reduce blood lead levels. All right. So our interventions are to reduce environmental health risks. Okay. Education is key. All right. Um, and a few examples of that, primary prevention, um, per, uh, carbon monoxide detectors, right? Um, changing batteries, knowing where, knowing where turnoff boxes are, you know, such as water turnoff, electric turnoff, those kinds of things. And then communication, right? Risk communication. We need to, we need to be able to communicate to communities about risks, right? We counsel people about the risks of pregnancy, communicable diseases, unintentional versus intentional injuries, personal health related choices, such as smoking, alcohol, diet. Okay, so communication of risk to both to, to the communication of risk to the affected community, right? We need to be able to understand what the potential reactions are, okay? There may be very, very upset community members when you have to tell them that, that, that there's been a train derailment, 
and there's toxic chemicals in the air and everybody has to evacuate for their own safety. And then more subtly, we see over the years, we've seen, you know, people being upset about other people smoking in public. Right? Because of the fear of secondhand smoke. Which is why now we have so many, uh, you know, we have smoking areas now that came from community risk concerns. Okay. And so risk communication includes communicating the right information to the right people at the right time. Then, and then is in every chapter, we have ethical issues. Public health has been defined as what we as a society do collectively to assure the conditions for people are healthy. Right, public health, in public health, we're concerned with public goods that can be achieved through collective action, such as clean water, safe and adequate housing, public safety, shared risk. And then if you wanna review that, this feel free, feel free box 6.6 .6 are some significant environmental laws. Clean Air Act, OSHA. OSHA was passed to ensure worker, worker and workplace safety. We'll get into more of that in chapter 32 with occupational nursing, but OSHA, um, here's a good definition. We need to know the defi de definition of OSHA. I know this is in chapter 32, but this is a good definition. We do need to know that for the next exam what OSHA does. OSHA was passed to ensure worker and workplace safety, right? The goal was to make sure employers provide an employment free of hazards to health and safety, such as chemicals, excessive noise, mechanical dangers, heat and cold extremes, or unsanitary conditions. So I would jot this down here because we're gonna need to know that for the chapter 32. Then advocacy, right? More than 3 million nurses. We should be an advocate, strong advocate for change. Informed citizen nurses can work to protect the environment, health of clients, families, and communities. We're seen as a trusted source of information and reliable. So they're gonna, communities are gonna come to us for what we're thinking. Right, we have the abilities, we have educational abilities, we have advocacy skills, we have communication skills that we can help maintain the calmness in the environment, in the community with certain environmental risks. Okay, so environmental, environmental health is pretty important in the community nurse setting. It's important in, all your settings, it's particularly, it's very important in the community settings because you're gonna have a lot more environmental risk exposure than you will say working out in the community versus working in a particular ward in a hospital. Okay. So that's it for environmental risks, environmental health. Do you have an under? Do you have a somewhat of an understanding? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the next, the next uh, chapter is epidemiologic. Okay, epidemiological applications. We're going to go through um, some test questions, NCLEX test questions, after we get done with these two chapters. 
um, like we did last week, and then we'll do the study guide. Okay, anybody have any questions so far? I have a question about the study guide, but since you just mentioned that, I'll wait. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, okay. So epidemiological applications, okay. Um, why can't I get this to be bigger? Can you guys see that? My, I don't want to click to add notes. Can you guys see this? Yeah. Okay, interesting objectives. Define epidemiology and describe how it's developed over time. Right, what are the essential elements of epidemiology? What's the epide what are the steps in the process? Okay, explain basic epidemiological concepts of population at risk. What's natural history of diseases, levels of prevention, host and agent relationships, and the web of causation. All right, and we'll need to know this, the difference between descriptive and analytic epidemiology. And I'll teach you that. Okay, and what is our role? How do we use epidemiology if we're in the community, if we're a public health nurse, community health nurse? How do we use epidemiology in our practice? Okay, here's um, the public health science of epidemiology is major contributions, okay, to understanding the factors that contribute to health and disease, the development of health promotion in disease, right, detection, early detection of potential infectious, um, emerging infectious diseases, and the practice of public health. So here's your definitions of um, descriptive and um, analytic epidemiology. Okay, so descriptive, is the determinants of health. So what's the disease? Who's affected? Where are they? When do? So the, the who, what, where, when. Okay, and the analytic is the why. How did it occur? Okay, why are some people affected more than others? Analy we're trying to analyze, okay? Think of it, analytic, analyze. We're descriptive, we want all that, we want all the, we want to know what was it? Who was affected? When was it affected? Where was it affected? And with analytical epidemiology, we, wanna know, we just want to know why. All right, so epidemiology is the study of populations, right, to determine the cause of health and disease to monitor the health in the population. And it also helps us determine health and disease in communities. So how do nurses use epidemiology? Um, we look, nurses look at health and at disease causation and how both prevent and treat illness. All right, we may be involved in surveillance of disease trends, maybe at home, schools, workplaces, clinics. I can, I can tell you over the last two years, I've been significantly involved in monitoring disease trends of COVID. Okay, I monitor in the schools, we monitor pertussis. We monitor chicken pox in the preschools. We monitor strep. We monitor, we're involved in, in the schools, we're involved in surveillance all the time. Well, so would a community nurse be involved in surveillance. May, may not so much be in the schools, but certainly in clinics and the occupational nurse may be involved in surveillance of disease progression in the workplaces. Okay, and here's some basic concepts of epidemiology. Measures morbidity and mortality, rates, proportions, risk, 
measures of incidence, prevalence, incidence and prevalence compared. These are a lot of big words. I'll show you where they are in the book explained. Attack rate, mortality rates, and epidemic. Okay, we're gonna, we need to know about this. This is called the epidemic, basic, con, more big, one of the basic concepts of epidemiology is the epidemiological triangle. Okay, we do need to know this for the next test, the difference. The epidemiological triangle comprises the agent, the host, and the environment. Okay, and so we'll go through this in the book, but the agent is what's the, what's the bacteria? What's the, like COVID? COVID would be an agent. Okay, who's, who's the host? Okay, it's us. It has to be a living, the agent needs a host to, to have. And the environment, it depends. What, what are all the factors in the environment that determine the relationship of the agent and the host? How sick people get. Okay, and then the web of causality we need to know, that's simply all the different, um, web of causality is all the different potentials that can come out of the relationships between the agent, the host and the environment. It's just a big web. Okay, so for example, let's look at COVID. Let's say you had COVID as the agent, your host was elderly, the elderly population and the environment was, let's say a long-term care facility. Were those patients at risk, at a higher risk? Yeah. Let's say you had the agent was COVID, the host was, I don't know, high school athletes. And the environment was football field, playing football. Are those kids as high at risk for exposure? No, they're healthier, they're younger. Okay, so that's what the web of causality is. It's just uh, um, the, how does the agent host and environment relationship play out? Okay, and then we'll talk about the ecological model, which is a tip, typical model that if nurses, it's really a basic model in epidemiology that nurses use when they're doing their study. It's, it's a really simple, quick, model to use um, versus the very complicated epidemiological models that I'll show you in the book, okay? Um, well, we know basic concepts in epidemiology. We know that within epidemiology, a primary would be immunizations, right? Which is prevention. Secondary would be screenings. And tertiary might be physical and occupational therapy post a stroke, post a, a fall, okay? Okay, here's some basic methods in epidemiology. I'm on slide 13, right? You have sources of data you have rate adjustments and you have comparison groups. There's a couple of boxes in the chapter I wanna take you to that will explain this, okay? Here's descriptive and analytic. Here's two slides that break these two down, 14 and 15. Okay, we talked about that at the beginning. Remember descriptive epidemiology is who was affected? When did it happen? How did, how was it affected? So this is just a little bit more detail, okay? Where analytic is thinking about why did it happen? Epidemio epidemiological, this chapter can get very confusing. So I'm trying to really hone in on what we need to know, okay? We do need to know more about analytic epidemiology for the upcoming exam. 
Okay, we do need to understand the difference between cohort between the two cohort studies. What is a prospective study and what is a retrospective study? Okay, and we also need to know the cross-sectional studies. What are they? And that's right in the study guide as well. Okay. So let's go to, let's see, applications of epidemiology and community-oriented nursing. So here's some example of nursing physicians that use epidemiology. Certainly the nurse epidemiologist, but school nurses, I use it all the time. Communicable disease nurse, environmental risk communicators, hospital infection and control nurses, right? All nursing documentation on patient charts and records is gonna be a really important source of data. If we have to go back in and start figuring out what if there's a hospital, an outbreak of a hospital acquired infection, you know, on a, on a floor or in the OR, we need that documentation to go back and collect data. Correct? So here's what we need to know from this chapter. Okay, we just went through the PowerPoint, which is this blue box, which is the chapter outline. That's your PowerPoint. Okay, here's your objectives, same thing. You need to be able to know these, articulate how to answer these. And I did highlight a couple of words that we need to know about the web, that were in the outline, um, but we need web of causality, risk, uh, epidemiology, uh, descriptive epidemiology. So I've tried to highlight a few words that you should know. Here's your Healthy People 2020 box, uh, page 148, and these are these are their objectives related to epidemiologic epidemiology. There's four of them. Okay, you need to know these. So just so you know, when I send you the case study answer sheet on Sundays, this is what it is, okay? So there's a case study in every chapter, I think, except a couple of chapters. Um, this particular chapter, here's the case study. Um, and so when I send you the answer sheet, I'm trying to help you not have, I want you to do it, but, it says answers can be found in Evolve website. I'm already providing them to you. So that's why I send these to you because I'd like for you to go through the case studies in each chapter. Okay, uh, basic concepts in epidemiology. We need to know about uh, rates, proportions, and risks. Okay, because we know that probability of risk for disease is a primary concern and we need to know how that affects different populations. So I just wanna take you down here to a box right here, okay? We need to know this box, table 9.2. Okay, so we need to know how to calculate, for example, let's say cause specific rate, right? So the number of deaths from a specific cause divided by the estimated population. So for example, example, 97,900 accidental deaths divided by the population equals your 35.6 per 100,000. 
And when, when people are providing epidemiological result information, this is how they present it. So we need to know about common mortality rates. We need to know the crude, how to come up with the crude mortality death rate, how to do it. And, and they're, they're simple. It looks, it looks confusing, but it's, it's simple. Crude mortality, the death rate. The other name for crude mortality rate is your death rate. Number of deaths from any cause divided by the population. So example, in 2010, there were, let's see, 2.4 2, 2 million deaths in the total population of 275 million, or 873 per 100,000. Okay, so rates, there's one more rates proportion risk that I wanna go through with you. Let's see. We just went through that. Okay, we'll go back to that, but I wanna to go to the rates proportions. There's a good, there's a good box about that. Oh, where is it? I'll get to it. I don't want to confuse you. Well, there's a good box that has race proportions, um, and it go. It's a it's a three section box. That's really good. So let's go back though. Okay, we just did that. Okay, let's talk about the epidemiological triangle. Okay, this is on page one fifty five. Right, epidemiologists understand that diseases result from complex relationships. All right, complex relationships, and these relationships are between agents, which is the actual infection, susceptible people, which are the hosts, and environmental factors. So, those are your three elements your agent, your host, and environment, called an epidemiological triangle. And changes in one of these elements of the triangle can influence the occurrence of disease by increasing or decreasing a person's risk. We just gave an example about COVID. Not everybody in the population had equal risk. Okay, so here's your three definitions of agent, host, and environment. Okay, so your agent is something, a factor that must be present for the disease to develop. Host is the living species capable of being infected. And then the environment is all that internal and external, all those things going on that may determine the, how the disease is, how it is manifested. Okay, box 9.1, this is a good box. Here's some examples of each. Okay, agent, infectious agents, bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites. Then your host, what is it? Think of yourself as the host. What's your genetic susceptibility? Do you have an immune, do you have a compromised immune system? Do you have lifestyle factors that are healthy or unhealthy that are going to contribute. You know, we heard of certain um, comorbidities that were were making people that got COVID sicker. Okay, and then environment. What's going on in the environment, both internal and external? Temperature, rainfall, climate, plant and animal life. Cr is cr is. Uh, are, are things happening in crowded places? You know, look at all the precautions we've been taking with social distancing with COVID, not being in crowded places. Socioeconomic factors, such as education, resources, access to care, all those factor into how 
how this um, agent, how this triangle is gonna, is gonna present itself. Does that make sense? And then your web of causality right below it is simply the web of causality recognizes there, recognizes that there are complex interrelationships for all these three, okay? That may increase your risk for disease, decrease your risk for disease, okay? So that's simply what the web of causality means, that it's a large web of causality. We don't know how it's gonna play out until we can identify all three factors of the triangle. Okay. Um, this chapter has a really good levels of prevention interventions. I know we're talking about epidemiology as a topic here, but for those of you struggling to understand the three different levels and want to, want more want more research and information and reading to do about it, to understand it, this is where it is. I think this is the best place it's presented in the whole book. Uh, it's page 156. Okay, so it starts with their primary 156. And then it talks about, uh, and of course, this is related to epidemiology, but I think it gives an excellent overview. Okay, secondary is on 156, and then tertiary is on 157. Okay. Okay, the other thing to we need to talk about is reliability and validity. Okay, what is reliability? What is reliability? The accuracy. Being able to count on something. Yeah, the accuracy. Making sure it's valid or reliable. And then what's validity? We want to make sure that what we think is exactly how it's how it is. It's valid. Right? Here's an example in the book. Suppose you want to screen for blood pressure in the community. You'll take the blood pressure reading on a large number of people, perhaps followed up with repeated measures for individuals with higher pressures. And what if the, what if the readings um, vary? You wanna get two consecutive readings that are accurate. Okay, so I want you to just read these paragraphs on reliability and validity. It's important for epidemiological studies. Okay, the other thing we need to know is the definitions of the basic methods of epidemiology. One is what is the source of data? How, do you, how are you gonna get your data? Well, you can get it by routinely collecting it. So the U, here's an example, a US census conducts every 10 years, provides population data, routinely collected data, vital records, birth certificates, mortality statistics, that's routinely collected data. Then you have data collected for other purposes. Then you have epidemiological data. This is the different kinds of data or where to get the data. And then the rate adjustment, what does that mean? Rates, which are essentially in epidemiological studies can be misleading sometimes when compared across different populations, right? So for example, the risk of death increases considerably after 40 years of age. So a higher crude rate is expected in a population of older and population that's younger. Does that make sense? So remember your crude rate is your deaths per population total population. So it should be lower in the 40 years of age 
your crude death, crude death rate should be lower versus your elderly, your 80 year olds. And then comparison groups are often used to collect data. Right, for the example they use is you might be investigating the effects of smoking during pregnancy on the rate of low birth weight infants by calculating the rate of the low birth weight infant born to the women who smoke during pregnancy. Right, so ideally with comparison groups, you wanna compare one group of people who have also certain characteristics, exposure or behavior with a group of people exactly like them, except they lack all those characteristics, exposure and behaviors, right? So comparison groups. So you're comparing the, the, the smoker, the, the moms who smoke during pregnancy versus the moms who don't smoke versus in pregnancy. And then here's some additional information on descriptive um, and analytic um, epidemiology. All right, so descriptive once again describes the distribution of the disease, death and other health, health outcomes in the population according to the person, place and time. Okay, so who got it? Where did it happen? When did it happen? And it goes through each of those person, place, and time, okay? And then analytic is why, why did it happen? How and the why, right there, okay? And then here were a few different, um, study designs that if the nurse were going to get involved, what kind of study designs might they use? You know, what's the quick and, e and typically nurses use the ecologic, the quick, easy, inexpensive first study. Okay. That's the one I want you to know. If you were conducting a epidemiological study and you were your first time and you wanted a quick, easy, ex inexpensive first study as a public health nurse, this is what you would use, your ecologic, ecologic model. But there are also a few other ones that I need you to know. Okay, I need you to know what a cross-sectional, and I'm just, you don't need to know everything in these boxes. You need to know a general description of what each of these um, each of these models are, study designs. What's a cross-sectional? What's a retrospective? Okay. What's a prospective? So there's five, I believe. One, two, three, four, and five. So put those on a card, please. You are you will get asked about a scenario, epidemiological scenario, and you're going to be asked what type of what type of major design might you would you use? Or what type of epidemiological design might you use for whatever scenario you're given? So just know the easy definition of each of these, short definition of each of these. And is this for this test or the next test? What do you mean? What do you mean? For what test? No, Where? I said this information, I'm, I'm writing it down. You said to know it. I said, are we studying that for this is coming up exam or the next exam? Um, we're studying for next week's exam. Okay. And then here's the descriptions of each of those right here if you want to read more about them. Okay. 
here's your ecological studies um, that nurses prefer to use on page 165. So have a look at that section. Um, levels of prevention, got to know this, page 167. Here, they're talking about cardiac, cardiovascular disease. Okay, with regards to epidemiological studies. Okay, but they, they give you uh, examples of each. So I want you to review that, please. Okay. I need to. Talked about healthy people 2020. I'm looking for my rates, proportions, and risk. And maybe it wasn't in this chapter. I'm going to find that and let you guys know where that is. But we do need to know the rates, proportion, and risks. All right. So, anybody have any questions about chapter nine? About epidemiology. All right, let's review um, chapter 32, which is the occupational health nurse. What does an occupational health nurse do? <coughs> what do they do? Well, what's occupational health? Where might a nurse work if she's an occupational health nurse? Maybe a factory or a business. It's a workplace, right? Workplace. Okay. Uh, no work is completely risk-free and all healthcare professionals should have some basic knowledge about workforce populations, we're in chapter 32, work and related hazards and methods to control hazards and improve health, right? So occupational health nurses, which is another role of the community nurse, have performed critical roles in planning and delivering worksite health and safety services. So this is the last of the specific roles we'll talk about. Um, so we have talked about the school nurse, we've talked about the hospice nurse, the home care nurse, the faith community nurse, right? I feel like I'm missing one. Um, then this is the occupational health nurse. Okay, so this is chapter 32, okay? Right, so what is the scope of occupational health nursing? Right, the, the spent, Occupational health nursing is a specialty practice that focuses on the preventative health care, health promotion, health restoration within the context of a safe and healthy working environment. So her job is to focus on health prevention in the workplace, health promotion in the workplace, health restoration within a safe and healthy environment. It also includes preventions for accidents, for health effects, adverse health effects from occupational and environmental hazards. And like we just mentioned a few of them, it's typically manufacturing, industry, service, healthcare facilities, construction sites, government settings, What is the scope of practice, potential scope of practice with an occupational health nurse? Worker workplace assessment and surveillance, primary care, case management, consulting, counseling, and other roles. This is all the whole scope of practice that the occupational health nurse may be, will be working in. Okay, this is where OSHA comes in. 
Okay, this is the one, this, you need to know about this. Occupational safety, what is OSHA? That's all you need to know. What is OSHA? And we'll go through that. And again, like the, like the faith community nurse and the hospice nurse, academic education is generally at the graduate level. However, many nurses with an associate degree in working in nursing or bachelor's degree in nursing work, work in occupational health. Has anybody ever worked in this group, worked in occupational health? Um, so when we're looking, when the nurse is looking at workers as her population, okay, um, so it's not an individual, it's not a family, she's looking at the group she works with are workers, okay, what are the characteristics of the workforce? What are the characteristics of the work? New equipment, old equipment, older characteristics of the workforce, older older population, younger population, work health interactions, what's the influence of work on health with regards to illnesses, injury, deaths associated with employment. Okay, so we do, we are able to apply the epidemiological model to occupational health. Right, and here's an excellent summary, excellent summary of the epidemiological model. What is a host? Any susceptible human being, assume that all employed individuals are at risk of being exposed to occupational hazards. Agent, All right, so the host is any one of us in our working environment, the agent, factors associated with illness and injury. What, what potentially are they exposed to in school, work, home, community. But here we're talking about work because this is um, occupational health. So factors associated with illness and injury, biological, chemical, environmental, mechanical, physical, psychosocial, all different occupational risk factors. And then environment includes all the external conditions that influence the interaction of these two. Healthy individuals, not healthy individuals. Obese individuals, not obese individuals, right? Unsafe environment to work in versus safe environment to work in. Right, so, so typically, there's on, typically there's on-site occupational health and safety programs, right? Optimally, within the workplace, there's a team approach, right? Which may include the occupational health nurse, the physician, industrial hygienist, safety professional, right? And what are they doing? What are they doing as a team? They're focused on work-related health and safety problems, right? They, they focus on primary care. What do they do with regards to worker assessments? Well, how do you do an occupational physical assessment? Right? How do you get the information on exposure to occupational hazards? How do you obtain an occupational health history? How do you teach the workers about workplace hazards and preventative measures? The nurse does walk, do a walkthrough of the site so she can visually, it's a windshield survey walking around seeing what potential risks are located within the farm, the plant, the building, wherever the workplace is. And we do need to know Healthy People um, 2020 objectives for this particular chapter as well. Okay. So we need to know these two these two agencies, the OSHA and the NIOSH. Okay, OSHA 
is your federal agency charged with improving worker health and safety by establishing standards and regulations, right? And by educating workers. On a bigger scale, they have um, the NEOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety, okay? Um, this particular um, group, this particular agency is responsible for investigating workplace illnesses, accidents, and hazards. Okay, so they're charged with investigating it. And OSHA, which is the main um, agency that we typically all work with in our workplaces, um, were they are improving worker health and safety by establishing standards. Okay, does that make sense? So that's your outline. Let's go to the book real quick. Pull what we need to know out of there. Okay, we just went through all of this, your outline, your objectives. I did highlight a few things. NEOSH, occupational health hazards, occupational health history, OSHA, We don't need to read through the whole chapter. We talked about the different kinds of um, industries with occupational health, manufacturing, service, agriculture, construction, new tech firms. Here's a uh, a little bit more detail on characteristics of the workforce, characteristics of work and how they've changed. Um, actually, I want, I, want to, I, want to, I want you to read through these two sections. I want you to read through how the characteristics of the workforce has changed, okay? Jobs in the economy, our US workplace and workforce is rapidly changing. Jobs in the economy continue to shift from manufacturing to service. Longer hours, compressed work weeks, shift work, job, reduce job security, okay? Part-time versus temporary. Okay, so these are the changing characteristics of the workforce. Okay, this is important right here. Demographic trends in the US workforce indicate a changing population aggregate. Um, that has implications for the prevention services targeted to the group, right? So what are some major changes in the workforce? Reflected in the increasing numbers of women older individuals and those with chronic illnesses who are part of the workforce, right? And because of the changes in the economy and the extension of the lifespan, legislation, social society's acceptance of working women, the proportion of the employed population that these groups represent will continue to grow. That's pretty important. And the characteristics of work, how has it changed? Over time, there's been a dramatic shift in the types of jobs held by people, right? So we've gone through the whole manufacturing era to now a high technolo highly technological workforce, okay? Here were our typical occupations, our service, our professional technical positions and our clerical work. But what I want you to know is down here, the change in the nature of work has been accompanied by occupational hazards. We're gonna ask you about um, 
newly emerging occupational hazards. I don't mean newly like in the last six months, but over the last several years, what's different? What's different about occupational hazards? Here's our list. So maybe you get a question like select all that apply. You know, in the list below, select all of the newly or um, the newly emerging occupational hazards. Okay. And there's your list. And I think it goes through and describes each one, but you really don't need to go through each one. But we do need to know this. We do need to know box 32.1. What are the five categories of work-related hazards? Page 564. Pretty simple, biological infectious hazards, chemical hazards, environmental hazards, and it gives examples, physical hazards, psychosocial hazards. So we do need to know, we need to be able to identify what the categories of work-related hazards are. Okay. Again, if you want a review of host, agent, and environment with regards to occupational nursing, here it is. Excellent. This is interesting. Table 32.1, nothing to memorize or anything like that, um, but it's, it's just very interesting. It's a job category. So for example, butchers, what are they, what are typically, what are they typically exposed to? vinyl plastic fumes, what potentially a work-related disease or conditions that they might end up with. Meat wrappers asthma. This goes through a whole, it's, it's really interesting. Like dry cleaners, there's their exposure to solvents, liver disease, dermatitis, right? I think it's interesting. So, and then it goes through each of the five. You don't need to particularly know everything about each of these five uh, categories. You just need to know what the five categories are of work-related hazards, okay? So there's no need to go through and read through all, all this. No need at all. Just want you to know what they are. I mean, you guys know what physical agents are, right? Pro produce adverse health effects to th transfer of physical energy. Just doing this one as an example. Temperature extremes. People that work in extremely low temperature, extremely high temperature environments. Vibrations. I don't know the mechanics, the 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 um, manufacturers, manufacturing plants, noise levels. Exposure to radiation, laser, lightning. Okay. Levels of prevention, we need to know 570. Pretty easy on occupational health. Provide education on safety in the workplace. Primary, easy. Secondary, screen for hearing loss resulting from noise levels. Screening, tertiary. Work with the employees with chronic diseases to ensure appropriate medication and use of blood glucose screening to avoid lost work days. What if the president of the company comes to you and says, hey, um, you know, it seems like we have a huge increase in absenteeism with our, with our employees who have diabetes. Well, after your investigation, your ad pie, your go, or after your assessment, you find out that, well, one of them doesn't have a working glucometer. One doesn't have the money to buy new batteries. Um, one has lost theirs. 
Um, and so we know they already have diabetes, but maybe your tertiary prevention is you provide uh, uh, an education program of how, you know, checking in what's going on, you know, why are there so many missed absenteeism, absent days? What can I do to help you get back on track with managing your diabetes? Right, so that would be tertiary. Okay. Um, this is this would be a this would be a good box to understand. Well, how do we assess a worker in the workplace? Right? What are they doing? Do they understand it? Do they understand the safety protocol? What are they doing in a disaster? Um, do, can they uh, articulate the hazards? Can they articulate what the safety measures are? What PPE they're supposed to be wearing? Right? Because your job is to prevent injuries, prevent adverse health outcomes. Right? So that's a good, this is a good part of your ad pie your A, your A of your ad pie. This is a good assessment box. Okay, and then there's your case study if you wanna do it. Um, I provided you the answers in the, in the week, over the weekend. And then this one we do need to know for chapter 32. What are Healthy People 2020 objectives that focus on occupational health? Okay, so put those on a card. They all make sense for the workplace, reduce, reduce deaths from work-related injuries, reduce non-fatal work injuries, reduce the rate of injury and in illness cases. So, okay. And box 32.3 has a little bit more information on OSHA and NEOSH, but I think I've already told you what you need to know. You need to know what the function of both of those are. Okay. And you could have a read through the disaster planning and management because obviously there's always a potential for disasters in the workplace. There's nothing you really need to memorize from this section, but I'd like for you to have an understanding of disaster planning and management in the workplace. Okay, and then there's your practice application. This is the other, this is the other activity I send to you, the practice application. Um, and I send you the answers to that. So if you wanna do that, um, I did, okay, so that's it for chapter 32. Just so you know, I did save, I was gonna go through them. Um, Let's see. I did save what I sent you over the weekend, which was the case study from chapter six, chapter nine, and chapter 32. Okay. Um, we didn't get it in a combined this week, so I had to send them three separate ones, but I highly encourage you to go through these case studies on your own. And really, I want you to read the rationales. I cannot stress that enough, all right? So you've got, this is an excellent rationale about, um, which, about environmental health risks. They're just uh, toxicology, number of ways to as assess environmental risk. We do develop the exam incorporating case study information. So I don't want to go over these right now. I want you to do them on your own. You have the answers and you have the rationales. Okay, what I'd like to go over is a study guide. Okay, how are we doing so far? Just doing a check-in. Everybody okay? Has this been helpful information? Yes. Okay, um, same, same cover sheet, okay? You know that we're covering weeks three, four, and five, okay? So you know the chapters. Um, 
so the first section is rural migrant, rural health and mig rural and rural health and migrant health care and cultural considerations. That was week three. Okay, so that would have been, I think that would have been chapter 22. All right. 22, I believe. This is all about chapter 22. We tried to organize it in actual weeks. Okay, I'm just trying to show you the organization first. Okay, the next section is vulnerable populations and healthcare considerations. Okay, this was chapter 23. Okay, where we talked about, what did we talk about? What were our four populations? Mental illness, teen pregnancy, homelessness, and what? Poverty, right? Okay, that's your second section. Your third section is chapter 24, which is alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. Okay, so your first three sections are the first three chapters in week three. Your fourth section, and we have it all into one section, is week four, faith community nurse, home health nurse, hospice nurse. So your fourth section is week four, both chapters. What were they? Um, what were our two chapters for? 22, 23, 24. Well, let's look back on this. Maybe I can. 29. 29, 30. 30 yeah. yep, 29, 30 were last week, chapter four. So your section four on here, your faith, faith community, that's 29 and 30, all right here on page four. And then today is page five. So that's actually pretty easy to remember like that. <clears throat> so page one, two, and three are week three. Page four is week four and page five is today five so let's see just let's just go into here and <clears throat> make sure we covered everything because technically between last week and this week all of this information in here the topics should be familiar to you i should have covered them with you so let's see okay so let's just review today first Know the definition of epidemiology and how it applies to infectious epidemics, right? So know the definition of analytic epidemiology. So we're even being more specific in here. We want you to know the difference between analytic and descriptive, but we're asking here specifically for analytic. So what, what question might you get? Maybe you'll get a scenario and you're asked, is this an example of analytic or descriptive epidemiology. So what's analytic? Why did it happen? Or why? Why? And what's descriptive? How did it happen? Who did it happen to? Where did it happen? When did it happen? Okay, the next one, case fatality rate. Okay, so go back to that box that we, we just went through in chapter, it would be chapter... Is it nine or it's either six or nine? The that box nine. that ha, ha, chapter nine. And if somebody's in the book, find find the page where that box is, where it goes through the case fatality case fatality rate, right? The people diagnosed with particular disorder who die within a specific period, right? So it's considered an estimate of the risk of death of somebody that's newly diagnosed. So let's see. People diagnosed with a particular disease often want to know the probability of surviving. So the case fatality rate provides that information. So we're even being more specific to you and saying in that box with all those, all those rates, we're asking you specifically to know the case fatality rate. It's page, it's page 154. Thank you. So whoever has their study guide out, put page 154 beside that second bullet on page five. OK, 
Okay, next bullet, individuals with immune deficiencies are at higher risk for illness after consuming contaminated food or water, including those with AIDS, cancer, chemotherapy, and a history of organ transplantation or organ anti-rejection medication. What kind of question might you get? What kind of question might you get with that? What population may be more at risk for health issues after consuming, I'm just making this up, contaminated food or water? Select all that apply. Well, we've listed those with AIDS, cancer or chemo, history of organ transplant or anti-rejection. We've given you four. Next, review Healthy People 2020 objectives for environmental health. Provide examples of each one. So what that tells me is you should go back to chapter six and know that Healthy People 2020 box. What's the role of the occupational health nurse? Go to chapter 32. We just went through it. It's where actually, I think the answer to that is right on your, it's on the PowerPoint, on like the third slide, I believe. What would examples of primary prevention strategies to reduce environmental health risks be? What's primary prevention? Education. So I think we talked about the example here of lead, lead, lead poisoning, right? What would be example of primary prevention? Teaching families about the dangers of lead poisoning. Next one, review the principles of the epidemiological triangle. No examples of each one. Why do we need to know about it? And gave you a hint here, look at box 9.1. Okay, um, go back and in chapter, I think it's in uh, chapter nine, in the definition of incidence and prevalence. Be able to give an example and apply to a case study. What's the difference between insulin, incidence and prevalence? And where do we find that in the book? On page 153. Okay, page 153. Whoever's doing that, thank you very much. You're welcome. Danielle, thank you. And then we talked about know the definition of what kind of method you wanna use for your epidemiological study, right? Remember that box, I, we highlighted five of them the ecologic, the cross-sectional, and the retrospective cohort study designs. And here, we're just asking you to know three. Okay, and then the <laughs> occupational health nursing, what's the role of the occupational health nurse? Review the hazards that an occupational nurse would evaluate, right? What are those five categories of hazards we talked about? Oh, page 564. 564. Danielle, do you wanna help teach? Thank you. Um, review Sorry, the level. am I helping? Am I helping? Because I, I Yes. Okay, yes. all right. Yes, otherwise I have to keep flipping back to the book. And I know we've already reviewed it. So Danielle is just trying to help you guys, save you guys some time going back looking for it. So I appreciate it. Review, review the levels of prevention and occupational health the nurse would implement. Tells you what you need to do. Look at Healthy People 2020. So know the box for Healthy People 2020 for environment, for um, occupational health. And then know the function of OSHA. That's 574. Okay, thank you. Know the function of OSHA and function of the occupational nurse forcing the rules and regulations. So quick question, is there anything in page five that we didn't cover today that's in your study guide? Hopefully the answer is no. Does that help to go through? That's how I think of using the study guide. And then if we go back to week four with home, let's see if we covered these from last week. 
um, at the top of page four, review the definitions of congregation versus institutional-based nursing. We did that. How does the faith community nurse act as an advocate and a case manager for the patients? Oh, it's the 2020 question. What are the different levels of prevention the faith community nurses provide following Healthy People 2020? So that's a chapter you need to know, Healthy People 2020. They talked at the very beginning of class last week about the differences between religiosity and spirituality, right? Religious, religiosity is focusing on one main religion. Spirituality is your big picture, your big picture view of spirituality in the world. Review the functions of hospice nursing. We did review that last week. So that's how I do the study guide. Okay, so I'm going to stop there because I want you to do the, I want you to do week three. I want you to do the same exercise we just did because it's 3.50 and I want to cover the attestation questions for today. Okay. Please, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Please, can you look at the first page? with us the question two. Okay. The physical demands of harvesting crops, that one? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, take the, okay, what, what's your question? I tried to look for it in the book. I don't know. Danielle, did you find it? I know it's in there. Um, do, do, and there was one other one that- I did um, not. You did not? I went through it. I went like line by line. Well, there's not so much that you need to go back to the book and find this. What you need to know is right here. Okay. Really no more okay. information that we're expecting you to know other than what is in this bullet. And so Rebecca, I would say the same thing to you. I think this is the next one. Rebecca, are you there? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Isn't this the next bullet that you sent me the email about? Yes, that's it. Okay, so I'd say the same thing about the second bullet is I don't need you to go back to the book unless you don't understand this. What we need you to know is this bullet. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Does that make sense? It does, so let's yes. Go through, let's go through both of them real quick since we asked about them. So the physical demands of harvesting crops 12 to 14 hours a day take their toll on the musculoskeletal musculoskeletal system. Back and neck pain were the most common types of chronic pain where many workers reported leaving or changing their jobs. Okay, so it goes through a little bit more information. What kind of question might you get? Think of a question that might come out of that. <laughs> With the long hours that the migrant workers on the farm work, what potential environmental risks might they might they present with at a local clinic? I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. They might present, and one of your answers is back and neck pain. You have to be able to think through what would they present? Okay, they're long hours, they're working on the farms. They, the, we know they're at risk for musculoskeletal issues. They may present with back and neck pain, right? And then Rebecca, identify health risks for clients in rural communities who, not, who do not seek care. So let's just think about that before we read any further. So they're going to have more chronic, um, disease, come down with more chronic diseases because they don't look for help on time? Correct. That's what we talked about last week. Just think about it in general. Um, for, for people who do not, for rural communities who do not seek care, what is that going to result in? More visits to the emergency room when it's at a crisis level, more chronic diseases that weren't cared for in the early stages. Right. And so if they don't seek care, they're going to have an overall decrease in health status compared to city people. Right. 
Rural clients are less likely to participate in activities during leisure time, right? Such as exercising, whatever, have decreased compliance with safety precautions, such as wearing a seatbelt. So they're gonna be more prone to accidents and they don't engage in preventative health screenings. So the identification of diseases is gonna be delayed, which is why the last sentence, chronic disease is more prevalent among rural clients. That's, um, it's that all on page sense? 377. It's like all over that page. 377. Okay. Rebecca, does that help? Oh, yes, ma'am, it does. Yeah. All right. I, I mean, it's not, I've, I've already seen that um, musculoskeletal issues on um, that same page with pesticide exposure. I just wanted something to be brought to be able to get clarity on it. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. So uh, can everybody fulfill their role as part of the team here and go back and do, go back and do this exercise for the study guide? I don't need anybody going back and reading the entire book, every chapter in the book that's covered for exam two. Okay, I want you to use a study guide as a outline. Okay, I want you to think about each entry into the study guide. What questions might be asked? Are they, could it be a definition question? Could it be a select all that apply? Uh, you know, if it's healthy people, gosh, put up yellow highlights through those healthy people entries in the study guide because those are chapters you need to know. A lot of people missed Healthy People 2020 questions in exam one, I was surprised. And when you get a Healthy People 2020 question, all the answers may seem like they're right, right? But it's not asking for what sounds right. It's asking what is Healthy People 2020 want? So a lot of you guys got that wrong. But you guys did really, really well on the, like I said, the levels, primary, secondary, tertiary. So keep that up. Every opportunity you have to read about primary, secondary, tertiary with all the different topics for covering, read through that. Because you have to have an, you have to be able to transfer that knowledge and come up with a primary, secondary, and tertiary intervention for each topic we're covering. And that's different. You know, if you're working with, labor and delivery or pediatrics, you know, your primary, secondary, intervent, tertiary interventions are geared towards that population, right? Or if you're in the community public health, you're gonna have to be shifting those all the time to meet the different needs of whatever population we're talking about. Does this help? I don't want you guys to consider this a review, okay? Just because I just because I went through this with you, I'm just trying to get you, give you a jump start. And my oh, I know that last thing. My understanding from talking to a couple of students is that there nobody has any tests next week. There's no med surge, and there's no. Your med surge test is this Correct. week, and your communities next week, and your peds is the week after. Correct. Okay, so I need everybody to step it up. And I need really, really high grades for this exam, which is why I'll do everything I can to help you guys. Okay, so um, please go through the exercise of going through the study guide. Number one, here's what you need to do with each entry. Number one, do you understand where it came from? What chapter? Where to go back and look for more information if you need it? Number two, what kind of question might I get asked about that? And number three, healthy, pull out the Healthy People 2020 questions and know those boxes. And having just read through real quick, pages one and two and three, we went through all that last week. I mean, everything looks familiar. So if, if, if you don't remember, we covered a lot last week. We covered five chapters. Go back to the book. Get some additional information. 
And you know what? If you have a minute, go to page five of your study guide. All the things we covered today, it's fresh in your mind. Make notes. Okay, can everybody go to their attestation, please, for week five? Let's get this done today. I hope this has been helpful. Okay, what's the first question? Three elements of the epi epidemiological triangle. Mm -hmm. Agent, host, and environment. Okay. Does it just ask you what it is, or do you have to give an example? No, just what are the three elements? That's all. Okay, there you go. So there's answer one. Okay, number two, we just went through. What are some changes in the nature of work? There have been many new occupational hazards identified. Name three of them. I think your list was like six or seven. Do you guys remember? Six. Page 563. Thank you. 563. Why don't you read us a couple of them? Um, complex chemicals, nanotechnology, non ergonomical workstation design, job stress, burnout, and exhaustion. That, those last three, job stress, burnout, and exhaustion are very, very valid. I mean, not that they all aren't, but yeah. Everybody's asking, being asked to do more with less, right? There is a high level of stress and burnout. Okay, well, there's your answer. So hit submit when you're done. Um, I hope you can try and get to, uh, I'll post this, um, I'll post the recording when I get it in the next couple hours, if you wanna review this. Um, I hope that you get to get to a review at the end of the week. Um, I hope this lecture was helpful and going back into the book and pointing out some specific things that support the study guide and then reviewing how I think it's beneficial um, to go through the study guide and think about the study guide. So you still gonna have a review on Sunday yourself? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And it's for everybody. You, you guys are invited to any of those four reviews, any of them. But, okay, so we're just trying to provide additional time for you guys to get, get in some studying get some reviews. Okay, any other questions? Um, I'm done. So if people wanna stay on, I'm happy to answer your questions, but for out of respect for your time, I'd like to be able to release you. So I'm gonna stop the recording. Everybody have a good rest of the week and